now. Okay. Um, welcome to um, Black Docents Collective um, third Saturday discussion. We um, we are um, present um, with the Grandmaster, with Grand Historian uh, Felix Gardner Hare. Is that how you say your name? Uh, Garden uh, Hire. Garden Hire. Garden Hire. And um, we're looking forward to uh, a robust uh, presentation and discussion um, around Prince Hall Masonry. But before we start, I'd just like to, as always, begin with our, our mission of the Black Docents Collective. And that is, our mission is to educate, empower, and heal the Philadelphia African-American community through the celebration of our history, culture, and African values. Um, and so with that said, Felix, you can um, begin and we can um, you know, go through and, and then have a, a discussion afterwards, if that's okay with you and the members. Yes, it's fine with me and, and uh, I'll get started. Um, I just wanted to do one thing really since we're, uh, I don't know if you can see. I think I'll just leave my picture up for now because the sun is shining. Okay, so again, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, this uh, presentation is gonna be about uh, our most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. And Prince Hall is in our name. So we are Prince Hall Masons and it's for the Black Docents Collective. And it's just a historical lecture of um, the important people that really got us going and they also were Masons. And so on this um, of first slide uh, that I have, the, the facing slide, uh, we have our first uh, worshipful master of African Lodge 459 was Absalom Jones. And right beside him to the right is of course, Richard Allen. And those are what we call our initial founders. When we became a Grand Lodge, he became our first Grand Master in 1815. So, and then all the way to the left at the top, that is just a picture of Prince Hall, who actually we are Masons after um, Prince Hall. And I'll just give you a real quick brief on that. Here is our present grandmaster, Paul A. Hibner, Paul Anthony Hibner. He's from our Latour Star Lodge in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Lodge number 18. And he's our 106th most worshipful grandmaster. So I always like to let everyone know who my leader is. And then here's my historical team. And I am the grand historian for the uh, most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge. So. Um, with that being said, and then as you can see also on this particular page, we have uh, one of the uh, pictures, I guess, of our Reverend Absalom Jones. Um, and uh, I think the Philadelphia Library Company may have this picture, I'm not quite sure, or it's either in um, one of, uh, it could be actually in our uh, Museum of Art. I'm not quite sure exactly where it's located, but we always use this picture in a lot of our uh, uh, presentations. Again, we know about slavery and to America, and that was the, one of the main focuses for what Masons did once we did become Masons. Absalom Jones and Richard Allen were Masons, but one of the you know most important things was of course the uh, Mason-Dixon line. And that's, you know, William Penn is the founder and that Mason Dixon line was a uh, dispute, you know, between uh, the Calvert family and William Penn. And it was finally drawn long after their death. Um, but it was important to us as Masons, as you'll see. Of course, you know, the Philadelphia history and we don't have to do that, but again, uh, PA gradual abolition of slavery was very important in uh, 1780. And then Benjamin Rush axing uh, Absalom Jones and Richard Allen's assistance in the yellow fever epidemic of 1793. We always point that out. And 
five out of the first seven presidents were Masons, but they also were slaveholders. So we do that on that slide. Um, our next slide uh, shows Prince Hall in Boston. And he was an outspoken opponent of racial oppression and slavery in New England. Um, not, uh, not a lot is known about him, but they think he may have been a slave. He may have come from the West Indies. Uh, his mother was probably a slave and then his father was either the his master at the time or is um his father may have been uh you know uh, uh a master at the time but he also was a tanner or you know a leather a leather worker and prince hall may have been born in barbados we always say he was born in barbados his father was a seafaring man they moved to boston with his mother and uh, there he eventually, if he was a slave, there's no, no, no written records to say he was a slave, but he was granted, you know, uh, to work in Boston and actually became initiated in, the, in 1775. We always say it's the immortal 15. It was Prince Hall and 15 others that were initiated uh, by uh, Irish Lodge 441. And he had made the request to the Americans, but the Americans refused. That's why I said in the previous slide about um, uh, the first uh, five of the first seven presidents, they were slaveholders. So uh, that was one of the reasons they refused. They didn't want to give masonry to a black man and then he go below the Mason Dixon line and free and give masonry to slaves down in their home state of Virginia and you know below that Mason Dixon line. So that was real important, you know. Um, then uh, as we move further, uh, Prince Hall actually requested a charter from the Premier Grand Lodge of England, even though we were just finishing up the Revolutionary War. Um, and um, that, that uh, charter was granted, even though, um, you know, we had just won freedom from England and, and uh, Prince, I mean, uh, King George III. So um, they granted the, and it took uh, about three years to arrive. And then the Philadelphians, Richard Allen, Absalom Jones, both former slaves who had bought their own freedom, um, requested a charter, uh, requested to come under Prince Hall's charter once they knew he had a charter. And then here is our prized possession is that charter. And uh, on this particular slide, uh, uh, the Grand Master at the time was Henry Frederick, who was a younger brother of King George, who they fought the Revolutionary War over, but they gave Prince Hall masonry, and that was, and that's our prized possession because we actually still have that charter. It's singed on the end. There was a fire in 1869. It was in a metal tube, rolled up in a metal tube. One of the past grandmasters from Massachusetts, where Prince Hall um, was the had been the grandmaster, he reached in, grabbed that hot metal tube, and this is how it is today. We bring it out every two years. It's in a vault in Boston. Okay, of course, Richard Allen, Absent Jones. I mentioned them. You know, they started the Free African Society. That's what Prince Hall admired about them. Then they both started churches. Of course, everyone knows about uh, what happened at um, St. George's Church where they were pulled from their knees uh, while they were worshiping and they went out and started their own denominations. Absalom Jones was done with the Methodist people. Uh, uh, St. George's Church in Philadelphia was the oldest Methodist church in the United States. And they were um, 
they were worship leaders there, but they relegated the blacks, of course, we all know to the balcony. So Prince Hall liked the fact that um, Richard Allen started, uh, they started the Free African Society and that's what Masons basically do. Mutual aid society, support widows and orphans, social and economic guidance, medical care, and so forth. So those were the things, uh, those were the attributes that Prince Hall had in New England. And he sort of enjoyed the fact that they started their own benevolent society. They wanted to come under his charter as Masons though, because they had a lot of seafaring men who had gotten their uh, degrees in England, in the Caribbean, in the French West Indies and so forth. So, um, Prince Hall liked what they were doing in Philadelphia, which was the largest city in the country. And of course, they liked the fact that Prince Hall actually had a charter to be of what we call, uh, you know, the uh, royal craft masonry, you know, so. And they asked him to come under the charter. We know all about Absalom Jones starting St. Thomas in 1792, but he was also our first master of uh, our lives once Prince Hall gave us permission to come under his charter. And he was our first grandmaster, as I previously said. Richard Allen was our first treasurer. And uh, he never really was a Grand Lodge officer, uh, but he started his uh, Mother Bethel, uh, well, his uh, African Methodist Episcopal denomination. Uh, he started the church first, and then he actually became the first bishop by 1816, I believe. And um, But he was the first treasurer masonically of African Lodge 459 Philadelphia under Prince Hall's charter. And... Um, he went on to uh, do, um, uh, we all know about uh, the Bethel burial ground at uh, right below Catherine Street. Um, and it's a playground now, and uh, but it's not too far from Mother Bethel at uh, Sixth and Lombard, or right, you know, between Pine and Lombard on uh, Sixth Street. And um, here's the indenture of course, that seeded a lot of that land and so forth for Richard Allen. Okay, now we're part of Prince Hall, we're under his charter, and I always do this slide. Meanwhile, now that we have masonry, basically what are we gonna do with it? And, um, and one of the Main things as Masons they wanted to do other than what I had previously said is they wanted to form not only that free African society, they had uh, abolitionist society and they did it in James Fortin's home. Uh, James Fortin was one of our first senior deacons or officers of African Lodge 459 Philadelphia. And then he went on to become and uh, our first uh, gr uh, senior grand deacon once we became a Grand Lodge. And how did we become a Grand Lodge? We took several lodges and they voted to start a Grand Lodge and that happened in 1815. Our first lodge under Prince Hall was 1797. So, you know, things moved slow back then. It almost took 20 years before we became a Grand Lodge, but we, formed other lodges and then those lodges came together. All right, so now we got uh, um, William Fortin in the mix. Uh, we have uh, William Gray, who was more or less the senior statesman. He passed away in 1811, but he was with that first lodge that we had. We had some uh, brothers from the Caribbean who had gotten their degrees because they were seafaring men and they came to Philadelphia. And one of the little tidbits I didn't tell you is that Peter Mantor, he was from the Caribbean. He's the one who wrote Prince Hall and said, hey, we're down here in Philadelphia. We already got our degrees over in England and stuff. 
why don't you let us come under your charter? And I'm sort of paraphrasing. And with that, um, if you do let us come under, we want Absalom Jones to you send it to Absalom Jones because he's going to be our master and so forth. So that sort of went back and forth for many years until it did happen. Okay. And then, um, then uh, some of our early meeting halls, Absalom Jones had became very influential in the city. He bought as many as 10 properties. Um, the property you see here, or the picture you see here, is actually one of our earliest meeting halls. One of the really the earliest meeting halls was 155 Lumber Street, which was one of his houses. And then he bought other properties. Um, he used, uh, when he, once he started his church, uh, the um, African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, he started it right in his home, which is 32 Powell Street. Uh, today, I believe it's 532 Delancey Street. Um, and then uh, this 409 South 11th Street, I have it highlighted in red, and this is what it looks like today. Uh, it was really a headquarters on 11th Street for the Prince Hall Masons in Philadelphia. It was rented in 1812, then Absalom Jones purchased it in 1814, and we used it for many years after that. We used it as uh, the Banneker Institute for our young people to, to actually learn and so forth. So it became a literary society and so forth. Um, yeah. So that's probably our earliest meeting hall. And I just mentioned a few of those. Absalom Jones died in, um, 1818, February 1818. And uh, he was holding this group of Masons together. Remember, some of them were from the West Indies. Some of the Masons were, uh, you know, they were from Haiti and, and some of the French, um, French West Indian in the islands, you know. Uh, and he was sort of holding this group of Masons together. And everybody didn't get along. So, um, he died, and then there was a notice in um, the uh, Philadelphia newspapers at the time. And it, the one to the right all says is a notice that all persons indebted to Absalom Jones because he had property. He has many as 10 properties. He, you know, he had made out pretty well. Um, he was one of the first rectors of uh, African descent in the United States and so forth by starting his, um, you know, African Episcopal congregation. And those are the people that they would have to settle with, Belfast Burton. George Jones was actually his nephew and James Johnson was, of course, the Rand secretary at the time. So the first notice, he, he died on the left. Second notice, uh, if you're indebted to him, you have to settle up with those three individuals. And then um, again, he was holding this um, confederacy of Masons together in Philadelphia. He was very revered. Um, he was the elder statesman. And what happened was, uh, 16 brothers, I wanted to get it right. 16 brothers said, we don't want to belong to this Grand Lodge no more. We want to go and do our thing. Uh, uh, we don't always agree with uh, how things are going and so forth. So they published that they were uh, a dissenting group and that they were going to leave um, masonry in Philadelphia. And uh, what actually happened was, um, Two days later, they were expelled. And they were expelled uh, in Masonic terms for 99 years, nine months, nine weeks, nine days. Uh, and so that's a long time to be expelled. Uh, it's almost a lifetime. So you, you're never going to come back. Um, but they went on and started their own Grand Lodge. Um, and again, another few years, they had spelled another lodge, 
And then almost 20 years later, they formed another Grand Lodge called Harm Grand Lodge. So now we're split. We got two Grand Lodges. And, uh, but we had influential Masons on both sides. Here's a picture of Stephen Smith. We all know about Stephen Smith and he was a Mason. He joined, I always like to call the first Grand Lodge was the blue team and this is the red team now. And he joined the red team. He was a pretty successful businessman in Columbia, Pennsylvania. Um, they burned down his business and so forth. And along with his brother-in-law, they came to Philadelphia. Brother-in-law was William Whipper, both Masons and both in Union Lodge number four. That was that expelled lodge uh, that happened that published that they didn't want to be in the Blue Lodge no more, or that Blue Grand Lodge. Uh, so when we say Grand Lodge, we're talking the entire state usually. Okay, so they govern all the lodges in the state. And so um, Stephen Smith, uh, of course, was very influential. He, when he did come to Philadelphia, he was not only an abolitionist, he was, you know, he sold lumber and coal. He did well in Columbia, Pennsylvania. And then once he came to Philadelphia, he did equally as well. So now your early Masons, they were free men. Um, they were influential, James Fortin. Um, sailmaker, Stephen Smith, um, and several others. And then you had others from the Wilmington, Delaware area. You know, the highway or the roadway was always using the river. So you had a lot of Masons that came from below that Mason-Dixon line. That top circle or arc at the top of Delaware was actually a slave state below the Mason-Dixon line. So a lot of them came north to Philadelphia, you know, because of freedom was, um, and it was the largest city in the United States. Okay, we had a lot of major riots and Stephen Smith actually financed Pennsylvania Hall. And um, after about four days after it opened, a mob burned it down. We also had a riot in 1834, uh, First African Presbyterian Church. So we know Richard Allen started the AME denomination. Absalom Jones started the African Episcopal denomination. And John Gloucester, another Mason in Philadelphia, started the African Presbyterian denomination. And um, they actually, and he was sort of housed on 7th Street. So the two groups that I mentioned, the red team and blue team, one was on 11th Street, one was on 7th Street, and African Presbyterian was on 7th Street. They burnt down the church, first African Presbyterian church in 1834. They burnt down their Masonic Hall, and they burnt down 30 homes in that area. African Presbyterian. That's why we don't have a lot of records left to this day about that side of masonry. Okay, let me just move on. because, uh, And then we eventually became abolitionists though. Remember, I keep talking that Mason-Dixon line. So along with a lot of Quakers who didn't, uh, who always were against slavery, um, uh, the, the Quakers, we joined up with them and as Masons, um, and here's just a picture of, uh, and I have arrows over some of the uh, Masons involved in this Philadelphia Vigilant Committee. Of course, William Stills over here, all the way to the bottom right. We have uh, Jacob C. White. Uh, he was a Mason. He was also Sunday school teacher for 40 years at African Presbyterian. Uh, and um, his son was uh, Jacob C. White Jr. He was a Prince Hall Mason. And Jacob C. White Jr.'s best friend, of course, was uh, Octavius Valentine Cato, whose father was the minister at First African Presbyterian, all Masons. And then up top is N.W. DeP. De 
Dupin. His father was one of the original Masons of African Lodge 459, Philadelphia, very influential. And his son was on this abolitionist committee. So now what the Masons do, all the stuff that I had already told you, and now they're abolitionists. Okay, and of course we know about the Underground Railroad, some of the station masters included, James Ford and William Whipper, Stephen Smith, James Needham, who was also on the Philadelphia Vigilant Committee. He was one of our grand masters, that's why I put his name in red. And then Jacob C. White, um, who was a druggist and he was pretty influential. He was a druggist or, um, and uh, he also had a burial ground, uh, Lebanon Cemetery. He started Lebanon Cemetery and his son was the secretary of that. That's where they hid many uh, runaway slaves from the South in Lebanon Cemetery in Bethel burying ground in the buildings or in the churches underneath the floorboards, they would drill holes in the floorboards, bring them up from the Delaware River, take them to the churches, either the burial grounds and so forth. So I think we all know that, but again, these men were Masons. That's what I always like to stress. Sometimes the Masonic story and American history gets separated, but you really can't separate them. And we know about William Still. Here's one of our proceedings from 1869. We only printed proceedings about every four or five years. So this is in our proceedings from 1869, I believe to about 1873, I'll say. And I think I highlighted his name in uh, yellow down, but it, he always used to sign his name W.M. Still. And of course, um, a picture of William Still. And then uh, major underground railroad stops. I already mentioned all those, the cemeteries. The Anti-Slavery Society was at 107 North 5th Street. And of course, William Still's boarding house was at 832 South Street. So, And here we have a call to arms by the Civil War. And what are we doing by the Civil War? Uh, all these men, mostly on this call to arms broadside, were Masons. And um, this was 1863, after uh, the Emancipation Proclamation took effect. It was signed in September 62. It took effect January 1st in 63. And then these call to arms broadsides started coming out. And just some of the Masons that are here. Uh, Needham, J.W. Simpson was in one of our lodges and William E. Gibson, all three of them were past Grand Masters. And then we have Whipper, Stephen Smith, um, Octavius V. Cato, um, Jabez P. Campbell. Uh, he was one of the bishops of the AME church and um, so forth. And we have NWDP on there, all Masons, you know. So Alfred Cassie of the famous Philadelphia Cassie family or Casey Cassie. I say Cassie, uh, that's the name. But that was a boarding house with about 20 something families living in it and very influential in masonry. Um, so and Jonathan W. Cassie uh, was in one of our lodges. He was like the uh, patriarch of that family. And then of course, here's the colored troops. Martin Delaney actually, who actually was um, in our, one of our lodges in Pittsburgh, very influential. And I think we know the Delaney story. And here's the grand review. And I'm just, uh, that's after the war. Then we're gonna to go to schools and institutions. We all know about the Institute of Colored Youth, which went on to become Cheney College and Cheney University. And of course, Ebenezer D. Bassett was in our Phoenix Lodge number three, one of our earliest lodges. He became um, uh, the first um, 
man of color or, or, or African-American to be a diplomat, and it was to the country of Haiti. He was the principal Institute of Colored Youth. And we just have a couple of those there. And then we have um, a picture here of uh, uh, Richard Howe Gleaves. He became a national grandmaster. Remember I told you he had a red, a red Grand Lodge and a blue Grand Lodge, and we kissed and made up in 47. And we called it the National Compact, you know, um, and it was Massachusetts that told, hey, y'all guys in Philadelphia, y'all got two Grand Lodges down there. Y'all need to, you know, stop the infighting and all that kind of stuff and heal. And we did that. And the National Grand Lodge was formed. However, the National Grand Lodge took all the power out of all the different states that are starting Grand Lodges, Ohio, New Jersey, New York, and all that. So uh, a lot of people got out of the National Grand Lodge and just had individual lodges. Uh, out of our two Grand Lodges that sort of kissed and made up in 47, we split apart again just about three years later. And then we came back for one final time in 1882, and we've been there together ever since. But that happened throughout Prince Hall Masonry. And then of course we have, uh, I, I, I'd be remiss to say that in 1906, well, really 1900, we started uh, Order of Eastern Star here in Pennsylvania um, and uh, really started out in the Harrisburg area. Uh, most of the lodges, I mean, most of the chapters were supported. And by 1916, we formed a, a second grand chapter. We formed one in 09, which is... Hello. Hello. You were supposed to. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Joel, 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 stop. Go ahead, go ahead, um, Felix. Okay, yeah. So I, I just wanted to mention that because we do have auxiliary that started in 1916. We started in 09 with five chapters, and uh, by 1916, we had 10 chapters, and we started what is known as our uh, grand chapter. Um, and I'll just scroll through those real quick. Uh, we all know about uh, Charles Albert Tinley, one of uh, from Tinley Temple. He was in our lodge number two, known as the Prince of Preachers and um, a lot of gospel music and uh, father of gospel music almost. And then uh, his competition, I mean, composition of I'll Overcome Someday is uh, almost like a civil rights anthem of We Shall Overcome. So, and right next to his picture uh, to the left is the hymn book from um, uh, Jabez Pitts Campbell, uh, who was in one of our, uh, well, he actually was in two of our different lodges before he passed in 1891. And he has a collection of hymn books um, he was the editor of the Christian Recorder and so forth for the AME Church. Also, he was an AM uh, African Methodist Episcopal Bishop. So, who else do we have here? We talk about our communicators. Uh, Pittsburgh Courier, very influential on the other side of the state, but of course, here on the eastern side of the state, the Philadelphia Tribune, with uh, Christopher Perry, and then his son in law took it over who was Eugene Washington Rhodes. Of course, there's a middle school um, at 29th and Clearfield in Philadelphia named after E. Washington Rhodes. He actually was in my lodge, Philadelphia Lodge number 74. And he was the son-in-law of Christopher Perry upon his death. He had married his daughter, Bertha, but they were the communicators for African-American publications. Um, very influential you know, on both sides of the state. Um, and all, um, you know, Robert Lee Van was in Jericho Lodge number 20 in Pittsburgh. And we of course have E. Washington Rhodes in one of our lodges. There are communicators. We had the Pyramid Club in the thirties and anybody who was, anybody and everybody was, uh, came to the um, Pyramid Club. 
Um, here's a picture of Herbert E. Millen, who was in uh, Campbell, Washington, Joppa Lodge, number 37, and one of our past grandmasters. He's with Ralph Bunch, who was an ambassador to the UN. Um, uh, so, and first African American ambassador to the UN. So, so Pyramid Club, very, uh, very influential for social and cultural activities. Horace Mann Bond uh, became president of Lincoln University. And even though his lodge was right outside of the city, it was right there in Chester County. Uh, but his influence uh, was really Lincoln University. Of course, his son is uh, named after, well, his son's middle name is named after his wife, Julia. And his name is actually a Horace Julian Bond, but we know him as Julian Bond. But very influential in uh, masonry. Uh, he was a uh, past master of our Mount Hebron Lodge 34. And then he also was the first master of the Lodge, University Lodge 141, which actually merged together because he took the students and he formed a lodge with the students out at Lincoln University. And then we went on to talk about Masonic giants like Hobson Reynolds. He was not only a past master of our Prudence Lodge number 11 in Philadelphia, he went on um, to um, buy a building, which used to be the Eccles Mortuary uh, College of Embalmers at 17th and Diamond, which became uh, one of our meeting places for all our lodges in Philadelphia. Uh, he became our Grand Master in the uh, late 40s. And then he went on about seven or eight years later to become the Grand and Zoller Ruler of the Elks and build that organization up worldwide to almost a half a million members. And uh, I think I was asked uh, by Michael uh, about um, other fraternal orders. And of course, I just mentioned the Elks. Odd Fellows, uh, the Grand Order of Odd Fellows uh, came along in 1843. A lot of our members were also members of the Odd Fellow, particularly about when we had a little dissension between two Grand Lodges and during that period, uh, the Odd Fellows emerged and became just as strong, if not stronger than the Masons by the end of the 1800s. And then we also had the Knights of Pythias, which is probably either no longer existing or very dormant, but we do have a couple members who are actually were grand masters who um, were members of the Knights of Pythias. Uh, they dressed in nice uniforms and back in those days, they loved a great parade and they always had the Knights of Pythias um, in the parades along with the Elks and the Masons. So. And Hobson Reynolds, I had already mentioned him. Um, here there with President Lyndon Johnson, Pennsylvania Masons, Reverend Leon Sullivan, uh, Father Thomas Logan and Hobson Reynolds all down there. Um, uh, and along with um, John Johnson, who's a Mason in Illinois and publisher of Ebony and Jet. Um, and there, Ad actually, uh, he's greeting, the president is greeting them at the time, and they were there uh, for a signing of a Civil Rights Act, a landmark Civil Rights Act. Uh, so this is a meeting at the White House. And of course, we know about Reverend Leon Sullivan, his o establishing OIC, and then of course, Progress Plaza. Uh, this is actually at the dedication of Progress Plaza. He was in our uh, Lodge uh, James W. Grant 131. And uh, we have Father Logan there, was Grand Master at the time when we dedicated that. And it's like a hundred, I'm uh, not a hundred, I'm going to say that wrong. 10,000 well wishers were standing out in front of the plaza uh, just to see this dedication. So, and uh, here we have Martin Luther King with. Uh, 
uh, several people uh, from the radio station. And we have Georgie Woods, who was in uh, our lodge, uh, named after one of our grandmasters, Herbert E. Millen Lodge, number 151. Uh, all the way to the right is Cecil Moore, who was in the same lodge. They both came and became Masons at the same time. Robert Klein was the uh, director and um, of the uh, radio station. And they were very involved with the civil rights movement and they're greeting uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy. And uh, of course we have the badge of the March on Washington in 63. We also were very influential even with the Million Man March in 1995 National Urban League, NAACP, and so all Masons, basically, very influential. And then we have Masonic recognition um, back in 1995 with the uh, Wright Worship Grand Lodge right across from City Hall. This is just a picture of their building. And we did it through our youth organizations at first, and then we hooked back up with England um, at the time. Here's some of our historians. One was Martin Delaney, and that, that's the book he wrote about the origins of Freemasonry, but he was mostly Western Pennsylvania. And then we have Lou Bell, who's um, deceased, and he's written a lot of history about the early, uh, early Philadelphians who started Masonry here in Philadelphia and it was discovery of a landmark, a lot about Absalom Jones, where they lived, some things at City Hall still indentures and so forth, selling the property and all that. And then Leonard T. Jones was also in uh, Lodge 151, and he wrote a book uh, from 1797 to 1982 about Philadelphia, Prince Hall Masonry in Pennsylvania, but specifically Philadelphia. He is a descendant of Absalom Jones. I want to get it right. He is the three times, I'm going to say at least three times great grandson of Absalom Jones, Leonard T. Jones, Leonard Theodore Jones. Family calls him Uncle Ted. He's deceased now, but yeah. And then I guess we can do questions here. I have, of course, um, Francis Johnson, Frank Johnson, uh, one of the, uh, he was one of the earliest members of our first lodge, African Lodge 459 Philadelphia. And he was, of course, a master musician. He's actually been to England and played for the Queen and so forth. And then, of course, we have one of our proceedings that I told you. And we have quite a bit of these left, um, maybe about three or four copies of this. This particular copy didn't have a cover on it. And we just took a picture of it, but it's from 1794 to 1797. And as you can see, that was from one of our two Grand Lodges until we made up in 1882. So I'll take questions now. How did I do? Eh, I still went about forty minutes. <laughs> but, uh, well, th well, thank, well, thank you, Felix. Um, what I'm going to do is um, stop the recording and.